for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So today we are celebrating St. Mark, or the, the writer of the Gospel of Mark. There's some interesting um, words of, or uh, data um, stuff about him. And, uh, you know, one thing is that he was the friend of Paul and he went with Paul and that and he had a, a fight with Paul. So they had like a, a, a conflict. So even among the saints, there is conflict. Everybody wins. Perhaps they could have tried out, but they did come back again and they reconciled eventually. Peter then goes with Peter. I'm sorry, Mark then goes with Peter. And so that's why we read today from 1 Peter 5, because Peter actually mentions him. He says in verse 13, she who is at Babylon. And so Babylon was the code name for Rome. So this is a really good apologetical note when sometimes a Protestant might say that Peter never made it to Rome, that Peter never was there. Well, his body is there now, first of all. But secondly, in 1 Peter 5, 13, Peter is actually saying, I am in, in Rome right now. So as I write this letter. And so he says, she who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. And so does my son, Mark. And so he mentions Mark as a son, someone close to him. And it, they say that most of his gospel is from the eyewitness of Peter. So he's speaking about P what Peter has told him. Um, then it says here, greet one another with the kiss of love. So as bishop, I shall reinstate the kiss of love. No, okay. But anyway, it says here, greet one another with the kiss of love. So uh, Babylon was the code name for Rome. Uh, kind of like when you're in a place that you can't mention the, the name, you know, if you're, it's illegal in like communist countries. In Nicaragua, if you speak bad about Daniel Ortega, you could be in bad shape. My uncle, who's, who was a radio guy, uh, he's uh, my dad's brother, he would work at a radio, but now he can't. Because if he says anything that might slip or they might not like, his life could be in danger. So... He's not working in that capacity anymore. So you have to have a code name, in this case, Babylon. Also, an interesting thing about Mark is that, uh, that his mother's name is Mary, like Jesus. And it was his house where Peter, or Mary's house, where Peter went to after, the, after he escapes prison, after he gets out of prison. Uh, his body also uh, was, uh, well, he founded the church in Alejandria. And then his body was was moved to uh, Venice, Venezia. So it's now in Venice. And, uh, you know, a, a small story really quick. When I was young and I was a swimmer, I remember, I, so it's like an apologetical note as well about the bodies of the apostles, about Peter in Rome, in Rome Paul in Rome, uh, Mark in Venice. And so when I was a young man, I was a swimmer. Uh, I we had to wear speedos, right? Which wasn't the coolest thing around, right? And so we would say, I had a little saying. I wanted to make a shirt that says, "Yeah, we wear speedos. Yes, we do. But who's got the six pack? We do." So I, I really wanted to to make that shirt. Never made it. But in a in a similar way, we can talk about the bodies of the first Christians. Who has them? the Catholic Church. Every body, whether it's Peter, whether it's Paul, whether it's Mark, whether it's James, who, where are these bodies in a Catholic Church? And so you realize that there's not, there's not, it's not the MMM Church, right? It's not in Nazareth alongside the river because they didn't exist back then. And so it's a really an apologetical note to say, who has the bodies of the first Christians because they claim to be the original Christians. They claim to be the true Christians. We're the apostates. We're the ones that lost our way. Yet those first Christians were the ones that would hold the body and honor the bodies of these holy ones. And it's the Catholics that have them. So it's an apologetical note as well. In the Mark as well, um, 
you know, you, that you can really see how important it is to read the scriptures as Vatican II tells us in the whole context of scripture. You have to take a scripture within the whole scripture in order to really understand. Because in Mark 5, 16, you might get the idea that Jesus appeared one single time, abraded them about their faith, told them to go preach the gospel, and then it says in verse 19, so then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. So you read Mark 16 and you might assume, man, he appeared on a Sunday, same day abraded them, same day commissioned them, and same day ascended into heaven. Mark had a very like just matter of fact way of putting things out. It would be something to the effect, you know, this first of all also makes us understand the human aspect of the Gospels. It's a human being that's transmitting what happened. So you have to understand it's coming through a lens of a human being and how they might present something. And the way I present something is very different than the way Father Lucas presents something, for example. Just in this room, each one of us presents the way things happen in very different ways. Right? And some might exaggerate more. <laughs> some might not get enough details. You know, so we're, we're all over the spectrum. And in this case, it, uh, like something like Father Philip. Father mm -hmm. Philip founded the church. I mean, founded the church. Founded Family of Jesus in 1990. Well, Father Philip received permission from Bishop Largan to start his community. Then he went to Tampa, served the poor. Then he went to Peru. And then he now gives himself to uh, missions throughout the world. That then doesn't say how many years, how many days. It's just giving you a very, very, very straightforward. And you could take it as this guy was like here, 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 and here and there. But here... We have to take the gospel also, you don't understand that between line 14 and line 20, there was actually 40 days that have gone by. There's 40 days. Luke says it in Acts of the Apostles, chapter one, he says that he appeared to them for 40 days. And so that's part of the gospel. That's, I'm sorry, part of the scripture. So we have to read Mark 16 within that lens, within that context. So we can understand that what Mark is doing here is summarizing. What Mark is doing here is just giving you a blow by blow and very quick a summary of what happened. He rose from the dead. He upbraided them about their faith. He spoke to them many words, and then he ascended into heaven. And so reading it right away, literally, you might think that's just one day. But taking it in context of the whole scripture, you understand there's actually, this all happens over the span of 40 days. These, these messages that he's saying go to the world, that those who are baptized will be saved, etc. over 40 days. And then he was ascended. And so uh, that's just helpful for us to see how important it is to not take scripture out of context and also to read it within the context of all of scripture. And uh, when it seems like it might be uh, contradictory, there's probably in scripture the answer to resolve your issue. So um, in uh, back now to the scripture itself, you know, so beautiful in 1 Peter 5, verse uh, 5, it says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. And I think we could just take that to prayer, you know, and be like, what does it mean to clothe ourselves with humility when we treat one another? And I think like Sister John shared on Sunday, I think one of the words I think that can really summarize humility, I think is reverence. You know, treating one another with reverence. And I think that I've never regretted treating something somebody with reverence. I've never regretted. I've regretted like opening my mouth too quickly. I've regretted speaking too harshly. I've regretted, you know, my tone of voice. I've never regretted teaching, teach, treating someone with reverence. And I think that that's what St. Peter is telling us, to treat each other with reverence and we can never go wrong, you know? And so also, humility also has a sense of, of putting someone and situations um, in their place, in their proper perspective. Because Paul says in, uh, in Philippians 2, 
we're, 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 we're memorizing that scripture, right? It says, uh, count in humility, count others as better than yourselves. And I think that we, all, we start to lose humility and we start to lose trust in God when we make of ourselves or make of the situation something bigger than God. It's when we make, when we make the, the, the sin or the suffering or the circumstance bigger than God. And humility is what the psalm is saying. We have to continually sing his love. We have to continue to repeat how great is his love. And that's one of the benefits, I think, of praise and worship. It's like it puts us in our place. You are the great one. You are the holy one. And this situation now all of a sudden is so small in comparison to your greatness. I am so small. And underneath one that beats themselves up for a sin, oh, how I've offended God, is really a deeper sin of pride. And pride is just inflating ourselves greater than God. And so humility also, like St. Paul says, treat others as better than yourselves. It's making ourselves, like Saint, like John said, and what, what, what Mother said to me also when we were praying and prayed over, he must increase, I must decrease. And literally, he must increase. And I think that this will give us freedom. This will give us joy, to walk in this joy of uh, this light. So it says here, it continues, it says, God opposes the proud. And so... He, he actually opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And I think that that's a, a key there. When we do place ourselves in that place, he gives grace to us. That's when we can jump over and scale any wall, as the psalm says. That's when we are great and big. That's when we can overcome any circumstance in any situation. It's precisely when we recognize our smallness, our inability, and his greatness, his faithfulness. And sometimes it's a process. And that's why he says this, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that in due time, in due time, so maybe it's not gonna be today, but in due time, you keep trusting. In deep time, you keep walking. In due time, you keep praising him and he will exalt you. It says that in due time, he may exalt you. And he says, why? Because God isn't up there saying, I don't care. Rather on the other, on the opposite, it says, cast all your anxieties on him for he cares about you. And so this is the truth. He does care about us. And every anxiety, every worry, every circumstance is not bigger than our God. He is bigger than all of our anxieties, all of our circumstances. And in the end, when we look back from heaven, we'll be like, wow, we'll have true perspective. You know, like Ellie's band is a great example. Like during life, he could have said, or he probably did, and people might say, wow, poor man, how horrible a situation. But now where is Ellie's band? Where is Ellie's band now? And now when he looks back on his suffering, when he looks back, it was precisely his suffering that put him into the hands of God. It was precisely his suffering that changed him from Elisban to El Triunfador. And, and it was through this that now when you look back on it, you have a totally different perspective about it. And so in due time, he may exalt you, cast all your cares, anxieties on him, for he cares for you. And that's why when we resist the devil, we have to resist him how? In verse 9, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering is required of your brotherhood throughout the world. Suffering is going to be a part of this. There's, it's going to be hot. There's going to be mosquitoes. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be misunderstandings. And it says, this is part of the journey. But after you have suffered a little while, the God of grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. And so we have to continue that to remember through this suffering and after this suffering, he's going to come. And he says, will himself restore, establish and strengthen you. When I knew I was going to Thomas Delgado's house on that weekend, there was no matter what difficulty came, there was a joy inside of me because I knew what was coming on Saturday. 
And so when we also can store in our hearts the God of all grace, who has destined us to eternity, who has destined us to glory, who has a place for us at his side, this, this, he will come and restore, establish, and strengthen you. And so this then gives us that joy that Benedict XVI talks about of the Christian gospel. And, and, that is, and, and, and that's why Jesus himself says, be of good cheer, for I have conquered the world. And so we can be of good cheer with him. And uh, it just, a, 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 if I could say just a, like a brief, brevissimo, as they say in Spanish, uh, uh, word on, this, on the gospel, Jesus abrades them. And, and why is that so important? He abrades them about what? What does he abraid them about? He says that in verse 14, afterward, he appeared to the 11 themselves at they sat at table and he upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. So going back to what Father Lucas was saying yesterday, Jesus is always saying, believe, believe my words. If you don't believe my words, believe my works. If you don't believe my works, believe my wounds. And he's always trying to help us believe. And here, especially what in the, his resurrection, he is, how important it is to believe he rose from the dead. How important it is to believe that the death will not have the final word. How important it is to believe that this circumstance or, or this uh, darkness will not have the final word. He will have the final word. And he abraded them for their lack of belief in the resurrection because it's so important to remember he has the last word. He did rise from the dead and he must give this to the apostles. Now, the great thing that Mary Healy and, the, and her friends say and the little guy here is that they say that this doesn't discredit them. He upbraids them, but then he commissions them. He upbraids them and his, uh, his correction is actually a preparation for them. So our, when we are corrected and when we are upbraided by the God himself, right? It's actually a preparation. But he doesn't say, now just get out of the way. Golly, you're just bothering me. No, his upbraid, he upbraids his apostles. And then he says, go to the world and tell them. And so the upbraiding, the correction is not a discrediting. It's not a disqualifying. It's a preparation. So then you can, from your heart, preach the gospel and the good news to all the world. So let us ask God to give to us this faith, this hope, and this love.